You know, it's, one, it's a great thing. I don't know if you've ever been away from college, but it's a wonderful feeling to come home. And uh, this was home for us. We raised our kids here. I, I designed this building over 35 years ago. And uh, to be back is uh, so special. And you know, if some of you are here today, you're away from home spiritually, aren't you? You're going to come home today. You're going to come home to Jesus. You're going to walk out of this room today with a brand new life and a new focus on life, because that's what we're going to talk about. Well, what a joy to be here. You know, Charlie and Nick, I'm a chancellor at Southwestern Seminary now and teach some preaching classes over there. And this last year, I had Charlie and Nick both in, in one of my preaching classes. They're working on their master's at the seminary right now. They both made A's. That's why, they're, that's why his dad lets me come back and preach here. <clears throat> but actually, they earned them. So uh, what a joy to be here, and what a joy to see what God is doing to resurrect yes. Yes. this place that's so special to us. And as I see it today, uh, you know, a little over 12 months ago, this place was down to a couple of hundred people, and a little remnant of leaders that were there, like Romney and Jose and they, who dared to do something never been done before, and uh, called David Hughes as the pastor of this church, to be pastor of two churches, two distinct churches at the same time. And uh, we're, we're in the midst of seeing something that's going to be a blessing to so many people because there are thousands of churches all over America that are dead today and yet have beautiful buildings. And they're, they're dead. When, when, when God finishes work of rejuvenation and revitalization here in this downtown church, it's going to be a testimony to churches everywhere of what God can do with people who abandon themselves to him and dare to believe that God is still in the business of making the impossible possible, because it is. So this morning, I want us to turn in our Bibles for a message today that I think can be revolutionary if you have ears to hear, from the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Now I see some of you scratching your head. If you, if you get to Nahum, turn right, you get to Zephaniah, turn left, and you'll be at Habakkuk. You need to get to know what Habakkuk's saying. You know why? You're going to meet him in heaven someday. What are you going to do? He walks up to you and says, hey, what you think about my book? <laughs> uh, duh. I don't know. Well, today you're going to leave here and you're going to be able to know. This is actually why a, few years, a couple of years ago I wrote a book called The Bible Code, finding Jesus in every book of the Bible, just for things like this, to help people understand that every book of the Bible is about Jesus and where he is in all those books of the Bible. So this morning, we're going to look at this book of Habakkuk as we think about this theme of keeping life in focus. You know, when we meet here today, we're living in a very uncertain world all around us. I've, I've been on this track for a long time now. I've never seen such uncertainty as we see in our culture today. It's uncertain economically. It's hard to buy a house today with mortgage rates, credit card debt is paralyzing people, inflation is high, and and there's so much economic uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future. It's an uncertain world politically in which we're living. You talk about a country that's has a political dilemma that's uncertain. That's this country. We're living in such a polarized political world today that if you're not on the extreme right or the extreme left, you're sort of in no man's land. And it's so uncertain what's going to happen in this country politically, and so much depends on it. It's an uncertain world socially where we've had an open border and have millions of people in this country. We don't know who they are. With the likelihood, uh, uh, our government tells us recently that there are probably cells of terrorists in every major city in this country today. We don't, it's such an uncertain world socially. It's an uncertain world nationally, where you, in many of the great cities, I'm going to preach in New York City in two weeks from now, and, and you can hardly walk down the street of New York City without seeing 
violence and all sorts of things happening there. San Francisco, well, L.A., just go on and on and on. It, it's such an uncertain world around us. Internationally, Iran and its axis of evil is disrupting the entire Middle East. Uh, we've got the, the Ukraine situation. We've got the Taiwan situation. There's so many hotbeds all over the world that could explode into a war at any moment. It's, we're living in an incredibly uncertain world. This is where Habakkuk comes in. 2,600 years ago, he wrote this book. In a situation in his country, exactly like where we're living today, economically and politically and socially and nationally. You see, Israel under King Solomon, had risen to be a world power, had wealth like no other nation. It was a world power under Solomon. And then the kingdom divided, and they had several wicked kings, and they came to a place where now, when we open our Bibles to Habakkuk, the Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar, just think terrorists, think whatever you want to think of evil, is coming down upon the people of Israel. Israel uh, and, and, and Nehemiah, I mean Habakkuk is facing a moral dilemma. How could God, who called Israel, his chosen people, who called them the apple of his eye, how could he be allowing this to happen? How could he be allowing this to happen? Where is God? Why doesn't he do something? Uh, and, and so in the midst of this dilemma, we, we come to the book of Habakkuk. He's perplexed by this. He's perplexed by the fact that God in the Bible calls Nebuchadnezzar this wicked king who's about, if you know history, is about to destroy the city of Jerusalem and take captive in, back into Babylon so many Jews that aren't killed. And God says in the Bible that he calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. How can that be? And so he's in the midst of all of this uncertainty, perplexed by it. And the truth is, none of us are immune to problems and difficulties and uncertainties that come in our lives. I mean, we could go person by person in this room. But you know what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Some people think, boy, you just get right with God and everything's going to be hunky-dory. All work, and no ease, all honey and no bees, and everything's going to be great. Well, Jesus said the rain falls upon the just and the unjust alike. So none of us are immune to circumstances and situations that come into our lives that perplex us like some of us are involved in right now. And so what is Habakkuk about? What's the message of Habakkuk? This is what I want to take you with you, take you, take with you today. It's about focus. Where are you focused? You know, problems come, situations come. Some of us just put all of our focus on that problem. It consumes us. This is what the message of Habakkuk is. Where to put our focus? You know, all through the Bible, Paul talks about this. You know, in the book of Colossians, look what Paul said in Colossians. In chapter 3, he said, If then you were raised with Christ, well, we were. Seek those things. Go after those things. Chase those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind. Focus. That's what he's saying. Focus on things above, not on things that are swirling around you. Right? They're temporary. Set your mind. Bring focus. What, he says it all. Well, I don't have time to go through everything, but look in Philippians. In, in Philippians, Paul says in Philippians Chapter 3, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. In other words, I don't, I don't think I've got it all together. But these 10 things I know, these five things I know, these two, these two things, no. This one thing, talk about focus. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth toward those things which are ahead, I press. 
It's, it's that, that word is that, like that runner, that, 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 that track star, that sprint race that he's pressing toward that tape where he reads. I press with every fiber of my being toward those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Jesus. I want you to look at that word goal. Some translates say, I press toward the mark. Now, if you're reading that in the language in which Paul wrote it to the Philippians, he wrote it in Koine Greek, common Greek. That word goal that you're pressing toward is the Greek word skopos. Now, we get an English word from that word, transliterated right over to English. Think what it is, skopos, skopos. It's scope. Right. You ever you seen a rifle with a scope on it? And, 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 you, and you, you, you're, you're looking at it, you're putting it at the target, and then you see those crosshairs in that scope. And you put that thing right in the middle of those crosshairs. That's what Paul is saying here. What's in your crosshairs? Where's your focus? What are you moving toward? What is your, are, are you just standing still? Are you going back? Or are you going forward? With one thing in mind. And what is in your crosshairs? What is in the focus of your life? Many people today lack focus. Some of you are in this room today without any focus in life. That's why you can't get it together. That's why you can't get off dead center. Habakkuk's going to teach you today how to really put your focus where it needs to be if you'll have ears to hear. Focus is important. You know, when I was a kid, there was a coffee shop in every town in America, every little village, every little hamlet, every suburb, every downtown had a coffee shop. And you could go in there and you could get eggs in the morning. You'd go at at noon and, and eat pimento cheese sandwich, tuna fish sandwich, whatever, had pies, had all this stuff. And then there came along a guy with focus named Howard Schultz out in Seattle. And he started a coffee shop with focus. Now, how crazy is this? He focused on one thing. You know what it was? Coffee. A coffee shop that focused on coffee. And most of you have been to Starbucks this week. You know, uh, when I was, came here as pastor in 1978, before most everybody in this room was born, 45 years ago, more, 46 years ago, uh, I wanted to send a package to somebody. It'd take a week to get it there. And then there came along a guy in Memphis by the name of Fred Smith, and he put focus on something. You know what he focused on? Sending a package with, that'd get there the next day. Overnight delivery. And Federal Express became one of the largest companies in America simply because of focus. But it didn't stop there. You know, some time ago, I'd gained a little weight. Sometimes, some time ago, I was preaching a funeral of a good friend. He was actually a Division I football coach by the name of Spike Dykes. And I was preaching his funeral, but I had to fly down there to preach his funeral. So the, Sunday bef- the day before I left, I went in and get my black funeral suit out, and I had a problem. I couldn't button it. <laughs> Susie said, it's no problem. I said, what do you mean? I, can't, I don't have time to go buy another suit. I can't, don't have time to get this and alter it. She said, it's no problem. Amazon has taken what Fred Smith did, but they focused on what? Same-day delivery. And by that afternoon, you know what I had? Spanx. <laughs> Spanx. And I'll put those Spanx on. I'm wearing, I'm wearing the date just for this illustration. I don't need them. But I'll put those Spanx on. I'll button that coat and I went and preached my buddy Spike Dyke's funeral. So focus is what we're talking about today. I only wear them because it helps my back. It gives me strength. So there are three ways people in this room today are focusing. And this is what's going on with Habakkuk in this book that bears his name. He only has three little chapters in it. Now look what he's doing in chapter one. Because you can write across that the fact that some people focus on their circumstances. Now I don't know about you, but I'm tending to do that too often. Something happens, somebody says something about me, or something happens, or some problem comes, and all my focus goes on that. It consumes me if I'm not careful. And I think about it. I wake up in the middle of the night 10 times thinking about it. And all my focus is on the problem. 
Well, this is what was happening. These Chaldeans, the Babylonians, are going to come down and destroy Jerusalem. Habakkuk is worried. He's focused on the problem. And look what he says in chapter 1, beginning in chapter 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, the prophet's question, O oh Lord, he said, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you about violence and you won't say, he's saying, Lord, where are you? My prayers are like, they're like they're bouncing off the ceiling. Why don't you do something? Where are you, Lord? I cry out to you about violence. You will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There's strife, there's contention that arises. And in the midst of all this in chapter one, he's got all of his focus on the problem. Lord, where are you? Why don't you do something? I'm calling out to you about violence, and you don't seem to save. And his focus is on nothing but his problem. And it brings confusion. And you know what it'll do for you? It'll, ask, it'll get you to ask a bunch of questions that can't be answered. Where are you, Lord? Why don't you do something? He's shaking his fist in the face of God. He said, I'm crying out to you about violence. You know, and you know what our tendency is? To start blaming God for our problems. Where are you, God? Why don't you do something? I cry out to you about violence, and you don't say. Some God you are, he says. And that's what happens to us. When we allow circumstances and situations to come into our life, many of you are dealing with something right now that's plaguing you. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's social, maybe it's interpersonal, maybe it's relational. Something. And, uh, and, and the tendency for some is to focus on the problem. You know, just because you're in a difficult time, in a storm of life, may not mean you're not in the middle of the will of God for your life. Because there are two kinds of storms in life. Some of you may be having a difficulty now, and it may be a storm of correction. That's what happened to Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah in the Bible? God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and there's going to be a right revival come out there. You know what he did? He said, I ain't going to do that. I'm going to try. He, he sailed in the opposite direction. And what happened when he got out there? A storm came up in the book of Jonah, remember? And they threw him overboard. And a big fish swallowed him. And then later, you know, not even a fish likes a preacher that's out of the will of God. He, he vomited him. He spit him up. <laughs> threw him up on the shore. And then he got repented. He went to Nineveh and a revival broke out. He got in a storm. Why? It was a storm of correction. He was out of God's will. And so this storm came along to get his attention and get him back in the will of God. Some of you are in a difficult period right now because you're out of the will of God for your life and you know it. And that's why that happened. But you know, there are also storms of perfection. That's when, that's when, that's when a, something comes to your life, but you're in the middle of the Lord's will. Remember the disciples one night, they, they'd been up in the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee masses of people had flocked to them and they were ministering to them and, and then Jesus that night said listen I'm going to go up in the mountain and pray you guys get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake and they did it they were obedient they were where God told them to be in the boat doing what God told them to do going to the other side of the lake and a big storm came up on the Sea of Galilee and they were afraid they were about to capsize and he came walking to them on the water, calmed the storm, got in the boat, and then what he said, why did you doubt, you guys? Oh, ye of little faith. You see, that was a storm of perfection. He was perfecting their faith. He was using that storm. They were in the middle of the Lord's will. Some of you are in the Lord's will. You're in the middle, middle of a difficult situation. That's what it is, a storm of perfection. You know, when I was here, you know, probably 40 years ago, I preached a sermon one time that I got the whole idea for the sermon one night when I was sick as a dog with my with a stomach problem, which I never hardly ever have. And I got up in the middle of the night and I went in the, uh, the medicine cabinet where Susie kept all the medicine. I got this bottle. I'm, I got to be really sick to taste this because I, I can think about it right now and want to throw up. It's a pink bottle called... Pepto-Bismol. Oh. And just about the time I was about to take that swig, I looked on the side of the bottle, 
And in big, bold, black, uh, red block letters, it had a saying. You know what it said? Shake well before using. Think about that. The stuff in that bottle that was going to help me get well had fallen to the bottom of the bottle. And I had to shake it up before it did. God comes along to us sometimes. And he wants to use us. But, but we, we let those priorities in our own lives sink to the bottom of the bottle of our lives. And something comes along and what does he do? Some of you are here right now and he's shaking you up. You know why he's shaking you up? Because he loves you. And he's got a plan for your life. And he wants to use you in a great and mighty way. So the best thing you can do is not focus on your circumstances. That's what he does in chapter 1. We turn to chapter 2. And now we see something else. Look, some people focus through their circumstances. No longer on them, but, but through them. You say, whoa, that's easy to say, but I don't know how to do that. Well, I didn't either until I understood what, Paul, what, uh, what Habakkuk was saying in chapter 2. Because he gives us five steps right there in chapter 2, that teach us how to focus, not on our circumstance, but through them. Here's the first word, perspective. Perspective. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. He said, I'll stand on my watch. One translation says, I'll climb up in the watchtower and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he, remember this, what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. Now, he said, I'm going to climb up in a watchtower. It's the first thing he did. You know, if you go to Israel today, I can show you these old watchtowers, circular buildings made of native stone. They're, they're about, you could, about this tall, like I'm elevated over here in a perspective here. And a, a guy that owned that field, he could look out over all his field from that perspective and see if the enemy was coming, see if anything was happening to his crops. It was a place of elevated perspective. That's what Habakkuk is saying. Perspective is important. To look at your circumstance, not from your puny, limited perspective down here where you are, but from God's perspective. To see that the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro over this whole world. What? To show himself strong, the Bible says, in behalf of those whose hearts are fixed on him. You remember the story of Joseph in the Bible? Everything that happened to Joseph from the human perspective, was bad. His brothers were jealous of him, that's bad. They threw him in a pit, that was bad. They stole his coat, that's bad. They killed an animal, put blood all over it, and told dad that he had, he had probably been dead, left for dead, they found his coat, that's bad. They sold him to the Ishmaelites, the enemies of God's people, that's bad. To betray your own brother like that. They took him down to Egypt in the foreign culture, that's bad. They put, they put him on a slave block, sold him like an animal. That was bad. He went into the master's house that purchased him, and he was faithful there. And then the master's wife began to seduce him. That's bad. And then when he said no, she ripped his shirt off of him, took it, and said that he had tried to rape her. That's bad. Then they put him in prison. That's everything that happened to Joseph, if you're looking at it from a human perspective, was bad. But later, when his brothers came, when the famine came, and he was revealed to them, what did he say in chapter 45? He said, listen, guys, don't, 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 don't blame yourself. Listen, it was God. God sent me before you to preserve life. And then in chapter 50, what did he say? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. How could he say that? Perspective. He was looking at his circumstance from God's perspective. You want to learn to look through your storm? Look at it from God's perspective. And what did he say there in verse 1? He said, I will wait to see what he will say to me. You know, that's part of our problem. We're waiting to see what we're going to say to him or we're going to say to each other, trying to get counseling. To this. When, when we will begin to look through our storm with focus, when we hear what he has to say to us, you know, that's important in prayer, listening to him. Susie and I were dating. First date we ever had, we talk, I talked incessantly. So did she, over and over and over and over. 
not, neither one of us wanted to think we should, but I want to tell you something. About three months later, if you'd have gone over to her dad's house and been hiding somewhere, I'd pull up there and we'd sit in that driveway. Sometimes we'd sit there for an hour and never say a word. But we were communicating a lot better than we were on that first day. Because there's a prayer that goes beyond the level of mere words. When we just sit before God and watch to see what He will say to me. Those Emmaus disciples said, did not our hearts burn within us? What? When He spoke to us along the way. God knows all about you. He's numbered the hairs on your head. He sees a sparrow when he falls. He knows everything about what's going on in your life. Perspective. Looking at it from God's perspective, and you'll begin to focus through your storm. Second key word is patience. Look what he says in verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Wait for it. You know, the true test of your Christian character just might be how you respond when you lose your blessings. Wait for it. Wait. Have patience. You want to look through the storm? You're in a difficult situation right now. Look from God's perspective. And then wait for, wait for God to come through. Patience. God will come through. You know, I preached in this, I preached hundreds and hundreds of sermons in this place. Saw thousands and thousands of people baptized in that baptistry. And then there came a time when it was our last Sunday, September of 1993. We were moving to be pastor of First Baptist Dallas. It was a gut-wrenching time to leave this place we loved where we had buried the 15 best years of our lives. And I was going to preach my last sermon here that, that Sunday morning. The moving van had come, taken all of our stuff. We sold our cars. We spent that last night at Lago Mar Hotel out on the beach. I didn't sleep hardly that Saturday night at all. Got up before sunrise, and Holly, our oldest daughter, who was going to be a senior in high school, moving her senior year out there, she was up. So she and I went out on the beach before the sunrise. And we were just sitting there in those beach chairs that, that Lagomar had out there and we're gonna have a little devotional prayer time together and we watched the sunrise and when it got, got enough light that we could read, we started reading our devotional and that morning, as God would have it, we were reading Psalm 130 and we got, came to verse 5 and you know what it says? Those who wait on the Lord are like those who wait for the sun. Those who wait on the Lord are like those who watch for the morning, one translation said. Listen, friend, you, you go out to the beach in the morning. The sun's going to rise about 6 o'clock in the morning. Go out there about 5. Get there and sit on the beach. Get your watch. Move it up an hour. You know what? The sun doesn't rise on your watch. It rises on God's watch. And there are two things you need to understand. God's not going to do it in your timing, but he's got a perfect timing for you. He's going to do it in his timing. And I'll tell you something else. There's never been a sunset yet that wasn't followed by a sunrise. The sun always rises. And listen to what the Bible says. Those of you who will wait on the Lord are just like those who watch for the sun, just like I was that morning. He's always going to come through. Trust him. Begin to look and focus through your problem. Perspective, patience. What's the third word? Promise. Look at, look at that same verse, verse 3. Though the vision tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. What a promise from God. In the kingdom of God, we live by promises, not by explanations. You know why some of you are in a difficult time right now? Because you're looking for an explanation. You want somebody to explain why this is all happening to you when God gives us promises to get us through them. You remember Naaman? He was the commander of the king's armies of Syria. He had it all going for him until he got leprosy. He went to all the best medical schools in Syria. Nobody could cure him. And he had a servant girl who'd been taken in a raid down in Israel and said, Oh, Master, there's a man of God down there named Elisha, and he can cure you from your lepers. He'd, get, he'd tried everything else. He didn't have anything else to lose. So Naaman goes to Israel, 
comes up to the prophet's house, and the prophet doesn't even come out to see him, sends his servant and says, listen, prophet said, go down and dip seven times in the Jordan. If you've seen the Jordan River, it's just a little old muddy stream. Go down and dip seven times in the Jordan. You'll be clean. Why, well, Naaman got back in his chariot, insulted. He said, man, we got rivers in Syria better than that. And he had a, had a servant in that chariot who said, listen, master, you've tried everything. That guy gave you a promise. The man of God gave you a promise. What do you have to lose? And the proud, heroic conqueror Naaman goes down to the Jordan, pulls off his royal robes, dips seven times in Jordan, and comes up, and he's cleansed of his leprosy. But he almost missed his healing. You know why? Same reason some of you. He was looking for an explanation, and God gave him a promise. In the kingdom of God, we live by promises that God gives us in the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about Russian roulette. I'm not talking about you opening the Bible and just going like that and say, oh, well. No. In the normal traffic pattern of your Bible reading, God will quicken a verse to your heart. And you'll say, you know that the Spirit of God said, this is it. Climb up here and stand on this and hold to this promise. How do you look through your storms, focus through your storms? Perspective, patience, promise. Third, participation. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his... That's the most misquoted verse in the Bible. It doesn't say the just shall live by faith. What does it say? The just shall live by his faith. We have the privilege of being participating with Christ. And I don't have the faith, but he does. I don't have the love, but he does. I don't have the patience, but he does. I don't have the insight, but he does. And he says, let's just put it all together. And you can share in my very being. That's what first Peter said. We've been made partakers of divine nature. We share in the very being of God. We are participating with God in this circumstance and situation. You know, when our daughter Wendy got braces when she was here, uh, she's so stubborn, so self-willed. She's a lawyer. And she's in the courtroom all the time. Uh, she and I argued from the time she came out of that woman's womb. <laughs> and she got braces when she was about 12 or 13. I picked her up and took her to school. She said, they were going to Westminster Academy. And I said, okay, time to get out and go to school. She said, I'm not going. I'm not getting out of the car. I said, yes, you are. You're going to school. She said, no, I'm not. I'm not getting out of the car. And she was scared. She said, Daddy, they're going to call me metal mouth. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to do all this stuff. I said, look, Wendy, I don't have any appointments today. I'm going to go back to the office. I'm going to be praying for you all day long while I'm working on sermons and things. Eventually, she got out of the car, and she lived that day, not in the strength of her own prayer life, but in the strength of her daddy's. That's what this verse means. You can live by his faith. You don't have the faith, but he does. And the just shall live by his faith. There's one other word. I'm going to wind down now. There's one other word to look, focus through the storm, and that's perception. Look what he says. Just go down the last verse in the chapter. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before. You know what Habakkuk's saying there? He's, he's reminding you today, God hasn't abdicated his throne. He's still in charge. He's still Lord. He's not up there looking at your circumstance and situation, wringing his hand, saying, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we? No, he's in charge. And it just may be that you're being shaken a little bit because he's got a plan for your life that's going to be amazing in the future. There's one final word. It's brief, and I'll close. But there's a better way to focus than looking on your circumstance or even looking through it. When we come to the last chapter, chapter 3, we don't have time for it, so I'm just going to go to the last verses. But look and see that some focus, go back to some focus, beyond their circumstance. Beyond their circumstance. And look what, the verse, look what 17 through 19 say in chapter 3. Though the fig tree may not blossom, Man, if everything goes kaput. Nor fruit be on the vine. <coughs> though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, and though the flock may be cut off from the fold, there be no herd. In the, this, this is the same guy that two chapters earlier has got his fist in the face of God. 
saying, where are you? Why don't you do something? Now he's saying, listen, Lord, if everything goes wrong, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high places, my high heels. Now, let me close with this. You know why he can say those two I wills in verse 18? I will rejoice and I will joy. You know why he can say those two I wills in verse 18? Because of the two he wills in verse 19. He will make my feet like deer's feet. You ever seen a deer, the way he jumps over fences and over obstacles? God will give you the ability to overcome your obstacles. Just like a deer overcomes theirs. And he will lead you to your high places. If you spook a deer out there in Texas on a mountain, they took off running. They don't run around the mountain. They don't run down the mountain. They run up. Up beyond the timber line. Up where the air is pure. Up where the hunters cannot come. He will lead you to your high place that he's got planned and purpose for you. If you'll move your focus from just putting it on your circumstance to looking through it, but in even better to look beyond it. This is the way we deal with the cross, incidentally. Do you know that some people, maybe some of you in here, you just focus on the cross. That's what the disciples did. They just, they just focused all, all their focus was on the cross. Cleopas said, we had hoped he had been the one. And the disciples, it says, they all, what? Forsook him and fled in the darkness because their focus was on the cross. Jesus focused through it. In Gethsemane, what did he pray? Not my will, Lord. Yours be done. And Jesus focused beyond it. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, for the, listen to this, so beautiful. For the joy, now think about this, Jesus was enduring the cross, listen. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. That joy was in seeing you put your focus beyond your circumstance, Put Jesus in the crosshairs of your life. And let he who died your death so you can live his life, he who took your sin, every sin you ever committed, and he suffered the shame and the hurt and the humiliation and the pain so that you could take his righteousness. So that today, Christ who was crucified, buried, and risen can now come to be your Savior and your Lord by opening the door of your heart by faith to trust in him. He's got you, incidentally, in his crosshairs. Before you were ever born, you know what the Bible says? Before I formed you in the womb, he said, I knew you. And I called you by name. And I set you across for a purpose. And then when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. You were in his crosshairs. And had you been the only person who ever needed salvation and forgiveness of sin, we still have the same gospel story. The cross, liberty. Put him in your crosshairs. Focus on Jesus. And you may be being shaken up a little bit, but it's only because he's got something beautiful for you. The joy that's set before you. Father, seal these words in our hearts, and we'll give you praise and glory for it. In Christ's name, amen.